Okay, and I think with that we should get started. I wish you a beautiful morning in the first real lesson of this year's course. Yesterday we had a little bit of an introduction lesson. We talked about how the course will work. I told you about the tests and the course structure and things like that. And today we are going to dive right into the topic. Yesterday we also took a look at the prerequisites and uh, things like that. And let me quickly repeat that here in the guides section of the course's GitHub repository you find the Angular preparation guide and here I summarized all the necessary software that I recommend to install for this course. So if you haven't done that, please do so. Please make sure that your laptops really work as expected. This is your job. You are adults. This is your tool. This is your most important tool. So make sure that you have the prerequisites installed. We will do all the tests on your laptops, as I told you yesterday. You can use whatever you want, but it's your problem if we are in a test and your computer doesn't work. That is not my problem, okay? That is part of this course that you keep your stuff in order, that you keep your laptop working, that you keep it up to date, that you install updates, security patches as necessary. This is part of the course, okay? This is your job. So please, whenever you have to uh, reset your computer, you get a new one or whatever you do, take a look at this software list and make sure that you have this software installed on your laptops. Good, that was the first one. The second one was that we started yesterday with, um, uh, with a small demo app, with a demo app in Angular, um, with, which we will use in order to get started with Angular because that is our first topic for this year in this course. And let me quickly repeat that for those of you who were not here, that was just the last 20 minutes of yesterday. So for those of you who already did that, please ignore what I do now. For those of you who were absent yesterday, that is a quick repetition. Yesterday we started with a new Angular application and for that we used the Angular CLI. You have the link to the Angular CLI in my material. What we did is we said ng-new and then um, press, just simply pressed enter. That is the interactive version of the Angular CLI. If you take a look at my GitHub repository, you will find in the guide section already an Angular guide where I summarize the most important things that we need to do. This is a living document. So um, we will cover various topics on Angular, C Sharp, Web APIs, and I will start to add more material to this guide. If you think that something is worth noting down, you can tell me, for instance, hey, uh, this is an important command. We don't want to write it down. Can you please add it to the guide? Just tell me, I can add it to the guide. Of course, you are always free to send me a pull request if you want to change something in my material. Or maybe you find a mistake, for instance, and you can always correct it by sending me a pull request via Git, okay? That's always possible. So if you don't want to have the interactive version of the Angular CLI to create a new project, you can specify all the different parameters here in the command line. See that one? So for now, I will stick to the interactive version. I will give it the name Connect3 because we will play with a tic-tac-toe game uh, for, for learning the basics of Angular. Angular routing, yes, maybe you don't know what routing is at this point in time, no problem, we will deal with that. CSS is a good option for uh, styling, it's the basic option. There are more advanced options like SCSS, SAS or less, which we will not cover in this course because this is not a core web development course, this is more focused on algorithms, Angular, TypeScript, things like that, so CSS is perfectly fine. But I want to emphasize that in practice, in a real world project, you will probably not use CSS directly. You will probably use something like SCSS, SAS, something like this. This is like TypeScript to JavaScript. It's an advanced version on top of CSS, which makes it more productive and more reliable and more feature rich to define your styles, okay? But for this course, CSS is perfectly fine. Now, the system is generating the necessary files. 
uh, the files consist of a nearly empty application. I showed you that yesterday. It's just a quick repetition, so we are all on the same page. Let me ask you a question. How familiar are you with Node.js? Okay. Okay, very good. So I will uh, also use this example to give you a quick intro into Node.js tooling because that is essential for understanding how Angular works. Angular does not use Node.js because Angular is a front-end framework. It is a framework that runs in the browser, so it doesn't need Node.js because Node.js is a server-side framework. Node.js would be an alternative to .NET and C-sharp on the server. However, Angular, the Angular tooling, the CLI, all these nice little tools, they are built on top of Node.js. So you have to understand at least basics of Node.js in order to survive in an Angular project, in an Angular environment, okay? Good. I hope everybody did that, even those of you who were absent yesterday, because now I have my Connect3 folder here. And if I take a look here, ah, I didn't install it. If I take a look here, I have a bunch of configuration files. All these JSON files are configuration files. We are not going to take a look in them. There is so much to learn about them for now. Let's have fun with Angular and later deal with the boring configuration stuff. But it's, it's really important, but not at the beginning. First, we want to understand the basics. And for the node stuff that I just mentioned, the important file is this one, and the important folder is this one. Question, does anybody know what this node modules thing is all about? Exactly, exactly. So um, what we have here is the installed NPM packages. NPM stands for, I cannot read what NPM stands for. No, that's a joke. Uh, NPM stands for Node Package Management, okay? Um, and Node Package Management uh, has a server site and it's stored at npmgs.com. It's a huge repository. It's a CouchDB plus a little bit of Postgres. It's a huge repository of hundreds of thousands of packages and a package is a library. If you create a great library where you think that the world would be a better one if everybody would use it and it's JavaScript, you would probably publish it on NPM and everybody else can fetch it from there. So for instance, if we take a look here at the Angular CLI, which you already installed, then you see that the Angular CLI is nothing more than an old package. So the Angular CLI is loaded from there or the TypeScript compiler. It's written in JavaScript, and here is the TypeScript compiler, okay? Hundreds of thousands of packages, and in Node, one of the hardest things is to keep track of all your packages. You typically have dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of dependencies to other Node packages. The same is true for Angular. And keeping that up to date is really a challenge because a good friend of mine always says that the typical node package has, um, has a refresh time that is shorter than a package of milk in your refrigerator. I mean, a package of milk holds for, I don't know, two weeks and the typical node package is updated every one week or so. So you really have to update your things regularly. Well, you don't absolutely need to, but you should keep your software relatively up to date. And that's a huge challenge. In my company, we build a lot of software based on Angular, and it takes us every single month a lot of work to do all the updates. If you don't like that, don't use JavaScript, don't use the browser, don't use TypeScript. That's the nature of JavaScript TypeScript. It's, it's, um, the innovation is really, really fast, and you have to live with that. It is like it is. If you want to build a software, then use it for 10 years, don't update it at any time in these 10 years, then you shouldn't use JavaScript. That's the wrong technology. JavaScript is for projects that benefit from modern technology, that want to keep these things up to date, that are continuously developed and that are cared for on a weekly or at least month monthly basis. That is what JavaScript is all about. There are other technologies which evolve much slower they are way more stable for a different kind of software. But Node.js and JavaScript and TypeScript, they are rapidly innovating. 
Good, this is NPM and node modules, this thing here is as you correctly said, the folder where NPM stores all the packages locally on your computer. And believe me, node modules is your best friend and your worst enemy at the same time. Why? Your best friend, because all your tools live there. Your worst enemy, why? Because it's huge. For a simple Angular application, we are talking about tens of thousands of files which, with hundreds of megabytes. So create a bunch of Angular applications on your disk and you have, if you have a small solid state drive, it's pretty quickly filled. So that's the disadvantage of node modules. What, another thing that you should always remember if you check in your Angular applications in Git, any kind of Git, never check in node modules. If you do that, things will explode and Kitten will die. Okay, that, that, you should never do that. I don't want to see node modules in any Git repository that you ever create. Luckily, Angular automatically creates a git ignore file. And if we um, take a look in this git, not in the git, the git ignore file, then you will see that somewhere here, the node modules file is excluded from being checked in into git. And that makes sense. Okay? So this is what took so long. When I created this thing, the system was, give me a sec, the system was waiting here for quite a long time. And this is exactly where npm downloaded all the stuff from npmjs.org into your node modules folder. This is what happened here. Got it? Good, question. Yeah, I didn't get the point why we shouldn't uh, put the uh, node modules into the Git. Because it's too large. It's simply, it's, it's way too large. And maybe this will answer your, your question if I kept the, the packages Ah, it's too early in the morning, I cannot type already. Um, package.json is a very important file. It's also generated in this folder. And in package.json, you have um, a collection of all the libraries that are used in this application with their name. So these are all the NPM packages that your application is going to use. And therefore, you can always throw away the node modules folder. Let me show, that, show you that. RM rf node modules goodbye it's now deleted from my hard disk i cannot run the angular application anymore but because i have package.json i can always ask npm to refetch the packages from the internet by simply calling npm install this is done automatically when you create a new angular app you don't need to care about that it's done automatically but if i need to do it manually let's do that and again I have to be patient, very patient, because it fetches down hundreds and hundreds of megabytes from the internet. Well, not really in my case, it's already in the cache, so it will be a little bit faster. But nevertheless, it takes a moment and fills up my node modules folder. So this is the reason why you shouldn't check it in. You check in the package.json file. This is important, but you do not check in node modules. Got it? Yep. So see, here, node modules, it's already filled. Fine, this is what I wanted to show you. Good, questions about that? You will definitely fight with node modules throughout this year. I'm absolutely sure everybody does it, everybody hates it, everybody loves it, it is like it is. Um, let me give you a quick tip before we really go into the application. I didn't mention that yesterday, but today we have the time. Um, there is a really nice website, which is called stackblitz.com. Do you know it? Anybody know Stackblitz? Oh, I love it. It's so great. It's so good. Um, because Stackblitz enables you to do um, JavaScript and TypeScript-based development directly in the browser. What you can do is you can open stackblitz.com. By the way, you can sign in with your GitHub account. And then you simply click on the Angular. And watch what's happening. One click, app is here. All the dependencies already installed, done. Did you see how fast that was? They did the whole install stuff. No files on your computer, no node modules folder on your computer, and you're ready to go. You can immediately go in here, type the code, and you're, and you're done. So if you want just a quick 
let's say sandbox, where you can try something in Angular. You can always use StackBlitz, it's perfectly fine. But don't expect StackBlitz to be as powerful as Visual Studio Code and the local development environment. So this is fine for learning, for small experiments, for teaching, for workshops. That's perfectly fine for a prototype, for a quick prototype, for instance. But if you really want to do professional Angular or Node development, you will probably need a local development environment. Okay, but st still, StackBlitz is a dream come true. Really, I love this thing. It's so good. And they are using, by the way, here in the middle, they are using Visual Studio Code. It's the web part of Visual Studio Code. I don't know if you are aware of that. Visual Studio Code is written in HTML, TypeScript, and CSS. In fact, you are coding in a browser if you use Visual Studio Code. That's the technology here. Good. So, speaking of Visual Studio Code, good. So, let's take Notepad. <laughs> this is installed locally. So, um, let's talk about JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can do something like, I don't know, let x equals 42 works. And in the next line, I can say x equals to foobar. Wow. That is absolutely not possible in C-sharp. That is absolutely not possible in Java. Many people now say, hey, JavaScript doesn't have data types. That's wrong. If I ask you whether JavaScript has data types and you say no, that would be a big mistake. Because obviously this is a number and this is a string. So yes, JavaScript has data types, definitely. But what JavaScript does not have is a strong limitation on the assigned data type for a variable. The data type of the variable can change from line to line. Here we have x being a number. Here we have x being a string. That is super convenient because you don't have to care about creating a second variable. You can call everything x and it's perfectly fine. But on the other hand, the computer cannot help you very much because the computer, the programming language, doesn't really understand your intent. It cannot warn you that maybe you wrote something like this and you simply made a mistake. It cannot tell you, hey, Reiner, this is a string. Do you really want to have a string? I mean, you used an, a, a number here. Is that a mistake? That would be nice, right? And this is exactly what TypeScript does. What TypeScript, not RS, TypeScript, what TypeScript does, if we say let x equals 42, and in the next line we write something like this, then we will get red squigglies here telling us that x is a number and you cannot assign a string to x. <coughs> so that's why TypeScript is called TypeScript, because it adds type checking to JavaScript. TypeScript is compiled to JavaScript. So at runtime, you simply have JavaScript. So an Angular app is programmed in TypeScript, but it is compiled into JavaScript. So at runtime, we really don't have strict type checking anymore. But at compile time, we have strict type checking. And that is super useful. That is really, really useful. Another example, question. Can we have a class in JavaScript? Can I write something like this in JavaScript? Is this possible in JavaScript? What do you think? If you don't know it, guess. No? no? Wrong. Yes. Modern versions of JavaScript support classes. They support inheritance, all the things that you are used to from Java, from C++, from C Sharp, JavaScript is a full-blown language nowadays. In the past, JavaScript had a really weird way of defining classes. It has a really weird way of, of doing inheritance, so-called prototype inheritance. It will blow your mind if you take a look at it, but hey, you are younger than me, so I had to deal with it, and you don't have to deal with it anymore because modern versions of JavaScript are much simpler in that regard. You simply can define a class. It works perfectly fine. But still, if I now say let p equals new person, something like this, then I can say p.firstName 
equals, dot, equals foo, that works perfectly fine in JavaScript. And I can also say p.age equals 42. I can do that in JavaScript, and it's perfectly fine. It is probably a mistake. Imagine that I would write first nim equals bar. That is obviously a typo. Here, I'm just missing an A. Would JavaScript complain? No. JavaScript would just say, OK, I'm fine. Let's call it first nim. Let's assign it. It's good. If I do exactly the same in TypeScript, this one, if I copy it down, and if I would run it, I would get here red squigglies. Because TypeScript says, I have no idea what you mean. First num? I don't know that. That's the difference between JavaScript and TypeScript. See? And that's useful. That's really, really useful. So sometimes, if you are simply doing a very simple prototype, just hacking around, trying something, JavaScript is great. But for a real-world project, where it really matters that your code works, maybe you have a larger team where you are implementing a module and somebody else will use it, then TypeScript really shines. And nowadays, you shouldn't use JavaScript if you have the option to use TypeScript. TypeScript is a de facto standard nowadays. And in Angular, we use TypeScript. In previous versions, wow, we are at 41%. I can't believe it. So I switched to, uh, to my Windows environment, and there everything is up to date. That is fine. Let's do that one. Um, yeah, this is our Angular app uh, opened up in Visual Studio Code. Yesterday, I already told you that all these config files down here are not really relevant for now. Just to recap what I did before, here in package.json you have all the dependencies in it. We will not discuss all the Angular dependencies for now. We will save that for a later lesson. For now, we simply want to learn a little bit um, about, about Angular. So let's go into source. Let's go into app. And here in appcomponent.html. And yesterday I already told you that Google is adding a bunch of marketing blah into this app component HTML. It's already written here, is a placeholder and can be replaced. So if you just created the app, please mark everything except the router outlet. The router outlet should uh, live. Everything else, die, go away. Good. Now we are good. Now we have a really empty Angular application and we can start it. Can anybody remember how we started our app yesterday? Yes, NPM start. exactly, npm start, npm start. Npm start is a shortcut, and today I will tell you about that. If we take a look at package.json, npm start is a shortcut for, you see it here, ng-surf. So please remember that in package.json, we can not only define the dependencies, as you can see here, but we also can define helper scripts that make our life easier. Angular did that for us. The real way of starting an Angular application is ng-serve. But it's a kind of um, convention that every Node.js-based application can be started with npm start. And therefore, they created a helper script called start. And behind the scenes, it simply calls ng-serve. So you could already also type in ng-surf in the command line. It would do exactly the same. Okay? So if you take a look up here in the background, when you run npm start, it really calls <coughs> ng-surf. That is what's going on behind the scenes. There are other helper scripts too, like ng-build or ng-watch or ng-test, things like that. And you can probably guess from the context what they do. They build the app so that you can deploy it on a web server. They run all the unit tests. Unit tests will be covered in this course, but later, this is what these things do. So please, on your computer, run the Angular app. That will give you, hopefully, a development web server. And you get a localhost 4200 port, which I can open in the browser here. And it's empty because we just deleted all the content.
right? If you don't trust me, go into Visual Studio Code, type in something like H1, hello world. And if you go into the Angular app, you should, should immediately see hello world. So it really works. Now, listen closely and remember what I tell you now. If something doesn't work and you simply see a white screen, believe me, that will happen. Homework, test, things like that. Then the first thing that you should always do is press F12. Are you familiar with the browser development tools already? Yes, no, maybe? A little bit? Okay. That is super, super important. And I will write it here in really big letters, F12, developer tools. Remember that shortcut. Because here in the developer tools, you have one of the most important places where you look for errors. And that's the console. If you have a mistake in your app, you will find red lines in the console. And in many cases, these red lines will point you to your mistake. I have seen an endless number of students sitting in front of a white browser page, scratching their head, asking me, it doesn't work, what did I do wrong? And my answer is always the same. Press F12 and look into the console. So, before you ask me, ask the console. Okay, that's important. Good, so F12 console, currently nothing is red, everything is fine. Some errors, especially when it comes to development time, are quite obvious. You can try that. Maybe you close an H2 while opening an H1. See that one? So if I take a look here, Angular is really nice and tells you pretty obviously what is going wrong with your app. It's clearly saying unexpected closing tag, but you always also see it here in the console. If you make more subtle errors, then you maybe only see the mistake in the console. This is why I tell you press F12 and see what's going on. Good, nice. Let's fix that. H1, it's good. Questions so far or are we good? Good, nice. So let's do, um, let's do a little bit of coding. Let's start by building a main menu. Okay, let's do that. Uh, this is just a quick repetition. I hope you are all a little bit familiar with things like HTML and CSS, at least a little bit. Yeah. Let's recap it a little bit before we dive into Angular because Angular needs both. It needs the traditional web development stack with HTML, CSS and so on. <laughs> and then it needs the TypeScript stuff and all these things which are um, uh, unique to Angular. So, Let's do an H1 and let's call it connect3, aka tic-tac-toe. Does anybody not know what tic-tac-toe is? Yeah, is that good? Good, I hope so. And then uh, maybe on top we do an um, unordered list. And there we do a list item and put an href, let's call level one, that will be what we work on today and let's call it level one. And just for demo purposes, I will copy this thing and I will call it two, three, and that will be level two and three. Essentially, we are going to build five levels of this, of this game. So if you want, you can already add these five levels. And then we have a header and the router outlet. Looks nice. By the way, a few shortcuts. You have seen me quickly duplicating lines. There is a shortcut, Shift Alt Cursor Down, which duplicates a line. Very, very useful. Do you already know this shortcut? It works in most editors nowadays. Shift Alt Cursor Down or Cursor Up, depending on where you want to copy it. Shift Alt Cursor Down. Cursor down is the, the arrow, right? The arrow down, yeah. yes. Shift, Alt, Cursor down. Yeah? Oh, yeah. And if you press just Alt, Cursor up, moves the line up. Cursor down, moves the line down. Give me just 
one more minute and then we go into the break, right? So let me summarize that. The two important um, keyboard shortcuts. I like keyboard shortcuts. shortcuts. Shift, Alt, Cursor, Key. Down or up is duplication. And just pressing Alt, Cursor, Key is moving the line. Moving it up or down. Works really good. And the last one, I'm not sure if you are familiar with that one. If you press Shift, Control, Alt, Cursor down, you get a multi-line cursor. And that means you can say go to, and you see it works across multiple lines. That is also something that you need pretty frequently. How did you do that, the last thing? Shift, con shift Control, Alt, Cursor. And that will give you a block cursor. I try to keep my hands on the keyboard all the time and try to avoid touching the mouse. Because that makes me fast. Maybe not on the keyboard. I'm used to a large keyboard at home on my desktop computer. And I do a lot of typos here on the small keyboard on my laptop. But still, it is something that you should do. OK, let's take a look. See, we have a beautiful menu. No, it's not beautiful. But it works. And we will style it in the second lesson. So for now, thank you very much for the first lesson. Let's do a five-minute break.